Good morning. Uh, happy, beautiful snowfall day in Minnesota. I'm glad that you were able to get here safely through the snow. Uh, I am an avid cross-country skier, and I feel like I won the lottery. I'm going to be spending all weekend skiing. But um, that's not what we're here to talk about. We are here to talk about a United DFL agenda for the legislative session. And while we've had some fun in the last couple of days uh, talking about the hashtag LFG and us being really ready to go, we truly are moving swiftly, more swiftly than I can remember in my 18 years of service because that's what Minnesotans expect and deserve. Although there were some bipartisan successes over the last four years, I had a really strong and effective partnership with uh, Majority Leader uh, Paul Gazelka. Many of Minnesotans' most important priorities were blocked by the Republican-led Senate. The House would pass fantastic bills only to run into the brick wall of a Republican-led Minnesota Senate. We've had a strong partner with Governor Walls over the last four years, and now we are so excited to have a trifecta and Senator Majority, uh, Majority Leader uh, Kerry Diedzik leading the Minnesota Senate. We're aligned on our values and our priorities, and we're ready to work hard and work quickly to meet the needs of Minnesotans. We're ready to build a state that works better for everyone. The bills you'll hear us talk about today are not all of our priorities. They are a representative sample of many of the priorities we'll be pursuing this session together. And the bills that will be introduced today are a starting point. Many others are still at the reviser and with teams of legislators uh, working on the final details. As we have frequently discussed, uh, the Protect Reproduction, uh, pre sorry, try this again. The Protect Reproductive Options Act, or PRO Act, is a top priority for the House and the Senate, and it will be House file number one and Senate file number one. Minnesotans have been loud and clear that they want legal protection for their reproductive freedom and their bodily autonomy. We will ensure that Minnesotans are legally entitled to make their own decisions about their health care. We're also determined to improve the economic security for Minnesotans. And one of the ways that we will move this objective forward is by passing paid family and medical leave into law. Everyone deserves the time to take off uh, when somebody is sick in their family or if they need the time to take care of themselves. Too often we're seeing people take time out of the workforce or leave the workforce altogether. And you know we have a, a workforce shortage, a slight decrease in the labor uh, workforce participation rate over the pandemic. One of the ways we can get more workers back into the workforce is to make sure that everyone has paid family and medical leave. Finally, in this election, Minnesotans were loud and clear that they are tired of extreme rhetoric, divisive politics, even the violent rhetoric that would seek to undermine our democracy itself. Democracy works best when everyone participates, and you will see DFLers in the legislature, in the governor's office, as you heard uh, in the governor's inaugural ceremony, advocating for uh, more voter engagement and more involvement. We're very proud to have led, almost always number one in the country in voter participation, but we are going to work to even strengthen that record by making it easier for 16 and 17 year olds to pre-register. Uh, we are also looking at automatic voter registration and restoring the vote for those who have paid their debt to society. Our state is in a strong position to address big challenges and we are here to address the needs of the people of Minnesota. I hope and I expect that we are going to make significant progress for Minnesotans this session. And now I'm happy to turn it over to my partner in the Senate, Senator Kerry Dietzik. Thank you, Speaker Hortman. I, as she said, I'm Majority Leader Kerry Dietzik, and I'm excited to join the Speaker and the House Majority Leader Jamie Long here today to lay out our shared priorities that we know will move Minnesota forward during this session. How do we know these priorities will move Minnesota forward? Because we listen to Minnesotans. In the past year, Senate DFLers knocked on over 500,000 doors, and we heard from people across the state who told us clearly that they are tired of gridlock and inaction. They elected a new Senate DFL majority to get things done, and we plan to do that by working with the House and the governor. Minnesotans told us they want an economy that works for everybody. They want their rights protected, their freedoms expanded, and democracy defended. 
They also want us to help lower costs where we can so they can afford their lives. And they want safe communities, quality childcare and schools, and a healthy climate. As the speaker pointed out, we are aligned on our values and our priorities, and we are ready to act. Like the House, the Senate will move quickly on the PRO Act, on paid family leave, and to protect democracy. After hearing from parents and school districts across the state, we'll also move to help schools and students by funding special education and related services so that kids on individual education plans can thrive. That will help the kids, the schools, and the local communities. We also knew, know that virtually every community across the state is having a shortage of affordable childcare and housing, and that impacts the well-being of children and families, it stops parents from pursuing jobs, and it prevents small businesses from attracting workers. We'll work to make both of those more affordable for families, and that will help families, businesses, and those local communities. And since we heard about the impact of rising, houses, rising prices on family budgets, We'll push to lower costs and help Minnesotans afford their lives by moving to put protections in place to prevent the type of price gouging that we saw during the pandemic and in uh, natural disasters. In short, our priorities are Minnesotans' priorities. It's what the people across the state told us they want us to do. And we plan to do that. We are going to get things done to improve Minnesotan. And now I'm going to turn it over to the House Majority Leader, Jamie Long. Thank you so much, uh, Majority Leader Dietzik and Speaker Hortman. So you heard some of our shared priorities, and I'm going to talk about uh, two more, those being uh, climate change and child care. Uh, we heard loud and clear from voters in this last election that climate change was one of their top priorities. It polled as a top five priority for Minnesotans and why they were showing up to the polls and choosing the candidates that they did. And it's no surprise because we've seen the impacts of climate change here in Minnesota more than almost any other state in the country. And so folks are asking us to move quicker towards cleaner energy that's going to be healthier for us and is going to create really good jobs uh, here in Minnesota. So one of the shared priorities uh, that we are going to be moving forward in the House and the Senate is 100% clean energy by 2040. That was a bill that's passed the House and that Governor Walls uh, has been a big strong supporter of as well. And on child care, we, uh, I happen to be uh, the father of two young kids, a, a five-year-old, a six-year-old and a four-year-old. And uh, today, uh, we have no child care, and so my uh, wife uh, luckily has a job where she can be flexible and stay home uh, with our four-year-old so that I'm able to be uh, here today for our floor session and our rules committee hearing. Uh, but not every family has that. There are a lot of uh, single-parent households and a lot of jobs that aren't as flexible as mine or my wife's. And that's one of the big reasons why we are seeing child care be one of the number one cited reasons that people aren't coming back to the workforce and to that uh, workforce participation challenge, uh, labor shortage that Speaker Hortman talked about. Child care is one of those top things that we can address to try to make sure that we're getting people back to work uh, and helping our employers find new employees. Uh, we also in Minnesota have some of the most expensive child care in the country. When you're looking at pre-K, it actually is the most expensive in the country. And that means that uh, a lot of families aren't able to afford it. It is the same, and I know as a, a young uh, parent of young kids, the same to put a kid into child care as it is to put a kid into the University of Minnesota for full-time tuition uh, in the state of Minnesota. And we're asking families to do that when they have a lot less uh, earning uh, in their careers at, at that point. So we are going to include uh, in uh, our shared priorities the Great Start Child Care Tax Credit, which is a $3,000 tax credit for families with children five years old or younger, uh, $3,000 per child with a cap of $7,500. So that will make a real impact in people's pocketbooks and their ability to get to work to help um, make sure that we're getting uh, that job uh, market turning again. And you've heard, I think, from uh, Speaker Hortman and Majority Leader Dietzik uh, about our shared priorities, but these should not be a surprise to anyone. These are priorities that we have been putting forward uh, for years because we have been listening to what Minnesotans have asked us to do. We had a joint effort called the Minnesota Values Project where we worked hand in hand with the House and the Senate and went out and did listening sessions in Minnesota years ago and heard these priorities from folks. We've introduced them in bills. We passed many of them through the House. We ran on them in the last election uh, and Minnesotans have rewarded us uh, with now majorities in both House and are asking us to deliver and we will deliver. 
Uh, and so with that, we'll open it up for questions. Can I ask about public safety? Um, that was one of the frustrations I think you had when you were dealing with the Senate Republicans. Uh, that's gone away. What might a public safety uh, package look like now that it couldn't look like a year ago? Well, I can speak to one uh, bill that we have in common in the early introductions, which is um, giving uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison the very small amount of money that he would like to uh, to prosecute more violent crime in greater Minnesota. He has, and his office has a very successful record of helping prosecutors across the state in prosecuting violent crime. The county attorneys want more help from the Attorney General's office, especially for those uh, less populated counties. And the Attorney General is up for the job. So uh, I imagine that that funding will move very quickly. Um, then we have a couple of other proposals. I'll let uh, Senator Dedzik talk about uh, their catalytic converter theft proposal. But in the House, we have another proposal um, to invest in public safety by putting money into crime prevention. Cedric Frazier has been really a strong spokesperson on doing what works. Uh, we know we need to give more resources to the BCA to process evidence, so we need on the crime fighting and the enforcement side additional investment, but we also need investment on the crime prevention side. Um, thank you. I think the, the bill that Speaker Hortman just mentioned on the crime prevention, I think we will find uh, broad support for that in the at least the Senate DFL. Uh, and then we also heard from Minnesotans. I know um, I worked with Senator Marty on the catalytic converter bill for the last two years because we heard from, I know in my district it was happening a lot. I know um, Senator Marty and I share a border and there was a lot going on on that border where there was a lot of, um, and it in, didn't just impact the, the cars. They were breaking into uh, a hardware store to steal stuff to actually do the converter thefts. And so um, we believe that helps Minnesotans. If your catalytic converter is taken from your car, ripped out from your car, it's, you know, cost thousands of dollars to fix. So we think that will help families. So we are going to be moving forward on a variety of different proposals. Anything along the lines of the governor proposed $300 million in funding to local governments to do what they think is necessary? We had that as amendment. The Senate DFL put that as amendment last year, um, public safety, local government aid. And so we are having that discussion uh, on that bill as well. And the House conferees were essentially there with the Senate. You know, if, if the Senate Republicans in um, May of 2022 would have been willing to uh, pass the agreements uh, that we had reached, um, that would have largely become law last May. Why is marijuana legalization not among your priorities to move forward? It is a priority. It is a very big, complicated issue, and we will be having a press conference tomorrow to dive into that more deeply. It is a criminal justice reform issue. It is critically important uh, that Minnesota right some of the wrongs that have been inflicted on our population because of our prohibition policy. Uh, but Representative Zach Stevenson will be the chief author on that, and my understanding is that that press conference will be tomorrow. And then those who are most versed in the various complex issues will be there to answer questions. Can any of you speak to um, which of these priorities can move in January? Um, I mean, it seems it seems as though that the abortion rights bill will be one of the first, but can you speak to that? The PRO Act will be moving quickly. There's some other bills, tax conformity. We're having a discussion. I think, I know the Senate is hearing that tomorrow. Um, so there are other bills that may or may not be on the list. All bills will have numbers. We're going to hear a lot of bills this year. Uh, we are taking a look and talking with the speaker in which of these bills maybe just requires one committee that a bunch of us are familiar with, and so can we move those? So we're going to be looking at, uh, we don't want to wait to pass everything at the end of May. We are going to be looking at what can move quickly, where we have agreement, um, and move them out so that, you know, to show Minnesotans we heard what they said. We, we know they're tired of gridlock, they're tired of inaction, and we're excited to be here today to get to work for Minnesota, and we are ready to get to work. Senator, uh, did you say that paid family and medical leave will move quickly in the Senate, and will that be using uh, cash from the surplus to start? I, I, did, I said uh, the PRO Act will move quickly, tax conformity is going to be heard um, shortly. The paid family leave bill is going to require a lot of committees, and so that will move through and we'll have good discussions in those committees, um, and we'll let the process work. But I don't know, um, similar to marijuana, it is going to be in a lot of committees, and so it will be moving. I don't know how fast it will be moving. 
You guys mentioned tackling the climate crisis and reducing carbon emissions. Um, could we see projects like the Northern Lights Express and all the other uh, clean transportation projects finally see priority? Absolutely. So trans transportation is the number one source of carbon emissions in the state. We've done a really good job uh, so far at trying to reduce the emissions from our utility sector and from the power sector. If we're able to get to 100% clean energy by 2040, as we're proposing, that's going to make it a lot easier to reduce carbon in the transportation, transportation sector as we're electrifying transportation there. But transit uh, is a really important part of that, and I know that Chair Hornstein uh, is rearing to go on making sure that we have uh, robust transit investments in the House, and I, I'm sure uh, Senator Dibble, uh, both of whom happen to be my Senate district counterparts, are, are going to be pushing really hard on making sure we have strong transit in the Senate, which is not just a mobility issue, but a climate issue, too. Can you give us a little bit more detail on the uh, child uh, care tax credit that you mentioned? Is that going to be the main tax relief that uh, your caucuses are going to be putting forward this session? Well, the, the hopper just opened today, so there'll be lots of things uh, thrown in. And, um, you know, I'm so pleased that the governor has hired uh, Revenue Commissioner Paul Marquardt. He is a brilliant uh, tax policy analyst. And, you know, Aisha Gomez is also brilliant. Ann Rest has decades of experience. I am really confident that the governor, under the governor's leadership, his revenue commissioner and our tax chairs will look at all the ideas that are out there and put together a package that everybody can feel great about. Um, right now, we're starting in lots of different places, right? We have some Democrats and some Republicans who want to do the Social Security uh, tax exemption. Uh, we know that has um, exploding tails, meaning it's very expensive in the future. Uh, if we're going to do something like that, we need to know what happens in future years to our investments in things like public schools. So we'll very carefully consider that proposal. It is in the mix, but the child tax credit is in the mix. And I think we share the goal of having a progressive tax code that provides uh, help to the people who need it the most. And the governor um, was very inspiring in his inaugural ceremony talking about uh, ending child poverty in Minnesota. And with the projected surplus that we have and the brilliant uh, tax policy experts we have working in that area, I think in the tax bill, you will see us make substantial progress towards that goal. Are you anticipating a bonding bill this year? <laughs> I, I am. Senator Pappas and uh, Representative Fu Lee, who are the chairs of bonding, I know they are um, excited to pass the bonding bill. Um, I have talked to Senator Pappas um, in the past and recently, where both of us are frustrated that stuff wasn't passed in May because we look at how interest rates have changed since May and how those projects, um, they're getting further behind and then they are going to cost more money and other projects are, are in the queue. And this is about preserving Minnesota's, it's not just about preserving Minnesota's um, infrastructure, which it does, but it's preserving Minnesota's history and helping making lives easier and helping invest in communities across the state. So we are um, excited that we are working on a bonding bill. And I'm happy for us to have a bipartisan package, and we should have a bipartisan package. Uh, but in the past years, we have seen um, Republicans kind of function as Lucy with the football. And, and we're a little bit, as Democrats, you know, in, in the majority in the House and, and Governor Walls, uh, we were Charlie Brown. And I'm not handing Lucy the football again. If, if necessary, we can do a cash bonding bill without Republican participation. This trifecta will not allow Republicans to be an obstacle to doing the work for the people of Minnesota. Now, having said that, there are a lot of great Republicans that we have strong uh, collaborative relationships with, and I'm very excited about the new leadership in both the House and the Senate, and I think you will see this team working very hard to have collaborative success in the bonding area, um, but we will get the job done one way or another. The art of listening. The art of listening. What have you learned over the years, whether it be from your party, the other party, or constituents, or, you know, uh, people that come here to talk to you? Uh, I'll go first. I'm yeah. sure we all have an answer on that. Um, none of us is as smart as all of us. You know, Mark Dayton spent eight years saying that. And um, when I first became our caucus leader in 2017, I thought, oh, no, now I have to have all the answers. 
And no, you just need to know who uh, to ask for advice. And we have focused on asking Minnesotans. Um, in 2017 and 2018, as uh, the new majority leader in the House has said, we went out and had town hall meetings all across Minnesota. Uh, we went with a completely open slate and said, you know, let's have a new conversation about public policy in Minnesota. And we have continued that work, and our members continue that work. Um, every day that constituents take the time to email us, to go to a town hall meeting, to give us a phone call, they help us uh, become better leaders. So um, the act of governing is all about listening. I'll agree the act of governing is all about listening. We were just talking um, in our caucus yesterday and reminding people to start setting up the town halls to have those discussions. Uh, as I said earlier, we door knocked over 500,000 doors during the campaign season, and we heard Minnesotans. We listened to them, and we heard them, and that's why we're ready to get to work, and we're excited to get to work. Um, it is about listening to what they're having to say, and, and I, I can honestly say I have listened to my constituents and actually offered bills and passed legislation that... Um, you know, they brought to my attention. And so listening helps. When we listen to Minnesotans, we, it helps the process. And that's why we want to have transparent committee hearings and we want Minnesotans to be at the table to hear what they have to say because we are going to be listening and we are going to be taking action. Can you talk a little bit more about the voting-related changes that you're putting forward and how you came to those? Yes, I think you're going to want to talk to Representative Emma Greenman, and the Senate author is? Lindsay Port. Lindsay Port, um, about the entire package. So in uh, House File 3, we have a large package, and there are many different provisions in that package. One of the most important is a bill that I know uh, Senator Champion and I believe uh, Representative Frazier will be carrying, uh, Restore the Vote. And that... Um, simply increases voter participation by allowing those who paid their debt to society uh, to rejoin um, the voting population. Another uh, very successful measure that's passed in other states that have had the Democratic trifecta, whether it's Washington State or Virginia, is automatic voter registration and allowing 16 and 17 year olds to pre-register so that when they turn 18 that they are legally entitled to vote. Can I follow up on that Maybe with Representative Long? So does the Chief Justice call you up and say, you do it? Because we've been waiting for 13, going on 14 months for a Supreme Court case on Restore the Vote, and I can't find anyone who can tell me cases have, have sat there longer than that. So might you be working on this, and then in the middle of session they decide to release a decision on that case? I know it's a complicated issue for the Supreme Court, and they have certainly uh, taken their time uh, on the decision. Um, but I think that our job as legislators is to uh, put forward what we think is, is right. Um, I don't know if the court is going to adjust their decision-making timing based on us being in session or not. I can't, certainly can't speak for the court. Uh, but I think that you'll find strong support in both chambers uh, for restoring the right to vote. Um, I carried uh, a bill last session on, on probation reform. Um, because we had some of the longest probation terms in the entire country, 40 years, 25 years, 30 years. And that means that individuals uh, who committed crimes in their 20s often aren't able to vote until they're in their 60s or 70s. And that's just absurd. So the lead plaintiff in that case that you mentioned was one, an individual who testified in committee on, on my bill. Uh, and so I think that there, uh, there is a real um, element of compassion to letting individuals participate in the process who are out, who are functioning in our society, who are working, um, who have turned their lives around, but yet don't feel like they can be full citizens because they're denied this really fundamental right. Is there any legislation specific to uh, northern Minnesota that you guys could see being a priority in pushing through in this uh, particular session? Um, Yes, yeah, so Senator Hothschild has introduced a bill or will be introducing a bill on the unemployment insurance, um, workers' comp, I think it's unemployment insurance for the miners up north. Um, I believe he will also um, be the author. I believe he will be the author of the child care tax credit because um, child care, he's a parent of young kids, and child care is a big issue um, in northern Minnesota and the unemployment issues in northern Minnesota. Um, we'll also be talking a lot about housing, um, we have heard, as a lead on the housing committee the last few years, we have heard from cities across across the state that that is impacting. We've heard from cities and the businesses in those in those cities that the lack of affordable housing is impacting their economy and 
They, they have jobs, but they have no place for people to live in. And so housing is another issue that um, is across the state. It's not just a metro issue. It is a crisis across the state. So there's a variety of issues that we will be working on that impact um, northern Minnesota and all across the state. Price gouging, we are one of the few states that don't have a, a statute that says you can't price gouge. And so that's another one that's going to impact people across the state. We just got a question from the Star Tribune about sports betting. Does anyone want to speak to that? I'm sure that Representative Stevenson will have a press conference on that soon. Uh, I, I will just say that you can look at last year's record. We had, I believe, somewhere between 7 and 10 hearings in the House. We worked consistently uh, over time with all of the interested parties. Um, the Senate Republicans, um, through uh, a hearing together three days before session adjourned, uh, as though to represent that they cared. Um, but if they cared, they would have done the work during the session. Anyway, so that's a kind of a conversation for another day. But I believe that um, we will be making progress on the issue this year. Can you talk a little bit about expanding the Minnesota Care buy-in and how you balance that with the needs of hospitals? Um, I hear constantly from hospitals, especially rural hospitals, that their finances are a shambles because of the pandemic um, and that, that this would make things even worse because the reimbursements are so low. Well, I think there's a, a lot of conversation that we need to have on the best path forward, and we have a lot of uh, committee process ahead and some new, new members and chairs who are going to be working on that issue. But I think the fundamental uh, principle of the Minnesota Care buy-in is that we still have people who can't afford health care in the state of Minnesota, and oftentimes those are folks who are small business owners uh, who find that the options on the exchange are unaffordable. Um, and so Minnesota Care buy-in is one tool that we can use to help expand and make sure that all Minnesotans have access to affordable health care. We made some really big strides uh, in the Affordable Care Act. Minnesota Care is a nation leading um, program that we have in the state of Minnesota, unique in the country. And so we really should make sure that we are letting all folks have access to that. It would also uh, lead to a lot more stability in the Minnesota Care program. So certainly a lot more discussion to have, but it's a really important priority. Uh, I have a question. Oh, you said that your uh, both of your majorities are united. How do you plan to stay united, and are you confident that you're going to stay united, given the slim majorities? We're going to have lots of conversations. We've met several times already since the election, and we're going to continue to have those conversations. Uh, I have talked to the Speaker and House staff, because a lot of these larger bills have moved through the House, where they didn't move through the Senate the last few years, and so we are going to be partnering with them to make sure our authors um, you know, know what happened in those House hearings and to, and to truly be partners and have conversations. I've talked to our committee chairs who are talking to their House counterparts. Uh, so we're going to have just a lot of conversations um, to make sure we are on the same path and we're moving on the same path. Um, but we heard Minnesotans. We listened. And so we're ready to get to work and we are going to get the job done. right to reproductive rights in law um, in addition to the Supreme Court having dealt with that issue? Right. Um, as you noted, the, under Minnesota law right now, because of a Minnesota Supreme Court decision in Doe versus Gomez, we have Roe-like protections on the basis of that Minnesota Supreme Court's interpretation of the Minnesota Constitution. We know that the makeup of Supreme Courts at the state and federal level change. And we think it is important to have that right enshrined in Minnesota statute, and that is the legislative's pr legislature's prerogative. The other thing that we think is important is to state on the record, in addition to setting forth the right in, this, in Minnesota statute for reproductive freedom and bodily autonomy, we will also note in statute that we agree that Doe versus Gomez was correctly decided, and there is a right to privacy in the Minnesota Constitution, and that protects all of us in reproductive freedoms, but also in so many other aspects of our lives. Would you consider concurrently introducing a constitutional amendment um, to enshrine that very uh, court decision in the Constitution? I think that that's Personally, I can, speaking for Melissa Hortman, the legislator, I think that's very important. We'll have conversations with our caucus and with the Senate um, to, to determine uh, whether that's the best course of action going forward. But I personally believe that we should do it, and we should do it as soon as possible. That's all we have time for. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>